Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneke Wakis porter You must be prepared to ignite. Coming up on this episode of The Entrepreneurial You. What I encourage people to do is before you quit your job and jump in full-time, try it on the side first and see what you think. Try and test ideas because people who start a business on the side are going to be uh, statistically about 50% more likely to succeed because you make a lot of the initial mistakes and you figure out if the business makes sense before you have the pressure of having to actually generate money or generate profits or cash flow that you need to live off. Hi, I'm Henneke watkins Sporzo, your inspirational leader and host of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Bookophilia, Patwa Apparel, and the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And now, let's go to today's episode. On the Entrepreneurial You today is a venture capitalist and private equity investor who has invested in leading companies in the United States, Latin America, and Europe. He's also the author of the international bestseller, The 10% Entrepreneur, A Guide to Becoming an Entrepreneur Without Quitting Your Day Job. The book has been featured by the Financial Times, the BBC, MSNBC, CNN and Espanol, Entrepreneur, Forbes and a host of other media outlets worldwide. He is credited by Boston Magazine with coining the term FOMO or fear of missing out, a term made popular by millennials and digital junkies that was added to the Oxford Dictionary in 2013. He is an avid traveler, writer and speaker and has visited more than 80 countries. Somebody please say jealousy right here. This Harvard MBA holder is fluent in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. I'm all smiles as I welcome Patrick J. McGinnis to the Entrepreneurial You podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And, you know, I have to update that because I went to some more countries since I sent that to you. So uh, I, think the num- I think the number uh, is 83 now. Awesome sauce, awesome sauce. I am <laughs> catching up maybe perhaps 20 or so. Let's see. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a very good start. It's a good start, it, yeah? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. All right, Patrick. So what is your best Jamaican accent? Give me your best Jamaican accent. Yeah, very random question. <laughs> so my sister-in-law is Jamaican. Yeah. And she once told me, like, never do a Jamaican accent. But I would say something like... Uh, the duppies up in here taking my festival. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you didn't like it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to give you it's, I'm going to give you something for effort. I'm going to give you a great for effort because you tried. Well, it was an I if for those who don't know, there's a this thing called a duppy which is like an evil spirit that causes mischief around the house. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like a traditional Caribbean thing. And festival is this really amazing bread from Jamaica. So I, where I lack an accent, I, I try to go for in vocabulary. Yeah, yeah I, I was about to say. And so for that, for that, you have, you know, you have an excellent grading, you know, for for the effort there, because you did talk <laughs> about the dopey, you did talk about the festival, um, the accent, hmm, not so good. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> So you have your own term in the Oxford Dictionary, huh? How did that happen? So FOMO, fear of missing out, is a term that um, you know is mostly associated with social media. The idea you go on Facebook or Twitter or your Instagram and you see what other people are doing and you you want to keep up with them. And it, it's uh, it's more than half of people who use social media have feelings of FOMO. But believe it or not, I actually invented FOMO in 2004 before Facebook was invented. So at the minute I invented it, actually Mark Zuckerberg was across the river in, in um, Harvard Yard, across from where I was living in, in the Harvard Business School, mm-hmm. working on the first version of Facebook. And what happened was uh, I was in this 
this school of about 2000 people, everybody's super type A, super competitive. So even though we didn't have Facebook, you basically lived inside Facebook or LinkedIn. I mean, everybody was around you. You saw what they were doing. You got um, sort of jealous or, or you wanted to do what they were doing. They were going for uh, traveling for the weekend. You wanted to do that too. They got the certain job. You wanted to do that too. It was just a very um, socially intense environment. And so I was very uh, affected by this. And like, I was at everything I did, every event. I went to every lecture, every class. I went to every party. I went to every trip. And so my friends started teasing me that basically I was overcommitted and that I had this fear of missing out on everything. Mm. And I like to create words all the time. So I've actually created in my life probably like 15 words, um, none of which made it to the dictionary until FOMO. Until FOMO. But, <laughs> but I've tried. I, I'm always inventing words. It's something that I do. If you know me, like you, you know I have my own lingo. Mm -hmm. And so I started calling FOMO. <laughs> I fear of missing out FOMO. Yeah. And then I, I wrote an article about it for our school newspaper that basically kept it alive within the Harvard Business School community. And then over time, as people graduated and they went out in the world, they started using it. And eventually it made its way into the business press. And then eventually it became a major word. There's over, over 5,000 um, hits when you look it up on Google. And so it's become this big phenomenon. It's just kind of it's mind blowing. I, I I could have never predicted this would happen. But you know, it was interesting. The first time I heard that I heard about FOMO was actually on uh, John Lee Dumas's podcast. You know, uh, the uh, Entrepreneur on Fire. And so when I went to that presentation that you did at the U.S. Embassy right here in Jamaica, and you know, to recognize that you are the man behind it, you know, I, I, find, I kind of felt, "Woo, I know him," you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It is. So we're going to mm -hmm, go ahead. The other thing there is that I, I think we talked, I don't remember if we talked about this, but you know, John Lee Dumas grew up in the same town as me. Right. You, his, yes, yeah. you were telling me. Awesome. I've actually had John on this podcast too, so it's pretty good. That's awesome. Yes. So now let's move into the real meat of the matter, right? <laughs> And we're going to talk about the 10% entrepreneur. What does that really mean? And I remember too from a presentation that you talked about the five reasons we should come, you know, we should consider it so that, you know, it's an alternative to quitting your, your, your full-time job to go pursue entrepreneurship. So let's talk about what is the 10% entrepreneur? Yes. So a 10% entrepreneur is somebody who invests at least 10% of their time and if possible, 10% of their money getting involved with starting, being an advisor to investing in entrepreneurial ventures while keeping their day job. So you don't quit your job. You don't go in 100%. You do this on the side. I'm sure you don't sit down necessarily though and to divide your time to say, okay, this is 100% of my time. Uh, I'm going to give this 10%. Is it just a phenomenon? It's just, just an idea of sharing your time or do you really think that, you know, you should sit down and really allocate 10% of your time, literally? Yeah, so this is how I thought about it. It's very much a mindset shift and it is a target. I don't sort of like divide my day now um, because I'm probably well over 10% at this point. But in the beginning when I was thinking about this, I actually thought about 20%. So the I actually was going to call the concept the 20% entrepreneur. And then I thought to myself, boy, that's a lot. That's a lot of time and money. Cause I was, I took, took my bank account and set aside 20%. And I started to think, how can I really give 20% of my time? And it felt like it was too much. And then I started thinking about, I started thinking about the concept of a tithe and religion and the idea that many religions ask us to give 10% of our earnings back to the church. And so when, and I'd always heard that concept, the reason why it sort of works well is because it's meaningful. You can really do something with it. It's, it's a meaningful commitment, but it doesn't require you to, you know, radically change your life in order to do it. Right. And so that was kind of what I thought about it. So when I, when I talk about 10%, I do encourage people to, to put aside a meaningful amount of time and if possible capital. But at the same time, the, the whole point is here is it should be a sustainable. It, you shouldn't have to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and change your life in a, in a radical way, because this is something you want to do over the long run and you want it to be very integrated in everything you're doing and not feel like a major sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But speaking of radical, um, your thinking is quite radical because while many businesses and business advisors rather are recommending that you know we hurry up and make that leap from 
from part-time to full-time entrepreneurship, you are actually suggesting that we do otherwise, which is not quite what you get when you, you know, when you go after, you know, startups, they're seeking business advice and so on. Why did you become so radical in this thinking? And did you think that it would fly to, to use a term from, um, from Pat Flynn? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny because I think of them as the radicals. I think of myself as like the ultimate pragmatist. But I understand why people think it's radical because there's two things that tend to happen as I see it when we talk about entrepreneurship. The first is people who have been successful entrepreneurs, people who have already made it, they look back and say like, well, the reason I made it is because I suffered and I gave my all and I, you know, I ate ramen for five years. And if you want to succeed, you have to do that too. And so it's really easy once you have made it through the, you know, the road to perdition or whatever you want to call it, once you've <laughs> made it to the other side, it's really easy to tell everybody else to do the same, right? Because you're done. That is, that's a reality. Number two is that people who are already, do, who are advisors to entrepreneurs, but maybe aren't doing it full time, it's very easy to tell other people to do it when you're not doing it yourself. It's like, you know, I, I hear this all the time from venture capitalists. Venture capitalists have a job, they get paid by a firm. You know, they are not entrepreneurs. Um, they're entrepreneurial thinkers, but they're not entrepreneurs, many of them. But they're telling other people that they have to starve and live in a, you know, in, you know, a very precarious lifestyle. Well, it's very easy to say that when you're in your office in Silicon Valley and you have a free Starbucks coffee and um, snacks all day, but you're not doing it yourself. And so both of those are, are fundamental truths. Now, what I advise people is, listen, if you can go full time, if you can afford to do it, if you really want to do it, if you feel emotionally prepared to do it, go do it. I'm not telling people that they shouldn't be full-time entrepreneurs. But for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people, it's not a possibility right now or potentially ever. Because in order to, to be a full-time entrepreneur, you have to be able to support yourself. You have to have some source of other income. And a lot of times, people who we choose to become full-time entrepreneurs already have money, either family money or they've already made money somewhere else. And so for them, that's great. But I, what I don't want to happen, this is the fundamental truth, is I don't want people to not feel like they can take a chance just because they can't go full-time. Entrepreneurship should be democratic. It should be something that everybody can explore. My um, approach is meant to open the doors wide so that all kinds of people are able to partake in the entrepreneurship wave. I quit my job eventually to become a full-time entrepreneur in retrospect. Perhaps I did that too quickly. I'm doing a lot of evaluation now, even after all those many years, and I'm at the point now where I'm about to make some very radical decisions, right? I've heard you talked about five reasons not to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> very interesting. We're going to take yes. a break, Patrick. And when we come back, we are going to be going into those five reasons why we should not become an entrepreneur. And um, may maybe just clarify by saying a full-time entrepreneur. Let's take a break. Success is something that we gradually work towards as an end goal, but we need to be in the right environment to make it happen. Bookophilia is dedicated to providing a space for book, coffee and tea lovers, creatives, educators, students and professionals who want ideas, innovation and inspiration. They have a variety of high quality books, a cafe, events such as book launches, signings and art exhibitions and Professional services uniquely tailored to your needs, culture, and tastes. Their environment provides for the full literary arts experience, allowing for multifaceted creative expressions. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bookophilia. We needed to raise capital, but our experience with local financial institutions was that they were cautious and slow to act and interest rates were far too high. We had real concerns about financing our business through outside equity investors and the possibility of interference. Could we get a fair valuation for our business? We had our own ideas about the business and its value. Should I go the traditional route of bank financing or should I try the Jamaica Stock Exchange? So we made a call and experienced transformation of our business through conversations. I'm John Mafood, CEO of Jamaican Teas, and we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Give us a call today at 876-967-3271 
to begin your transformation through conversation. We want to see your company listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Do you want to see the world fill with better leaders? Filling the world with leaders worth following starts with you, and you can be that leader in your company, organization, or community. On May 4, 2018, join more than 100,000 leaders from around the globe at the world's largest leadership event, LeaderCast Live. Broadcast live from Atlanta to a community near you, LeaderCast Live will allow you to learn from leaders like Andy Stanley, Michael Hyatt, and Dr. Jim Lur. For more information on this can't miss event, visit hennikawatkisporter.com and click on Leadercast Kingston and invest in the future of your career, your organization, your community and your world. Welcome back. We are talking with Patrick J. McGinnis. He is the author of The 10% Entrepreneur. And so while many business advisors have been positing, go, get, give it your all, go all in, quit your, full, quit your full-time job and, you know, go after your passion, he's highly recommended that you become a 10% entrepreneur. And here, Patrick, you are about to give us five reasons not to become an entrepreneur. Yes, uh... Not to be a full-time entrepreneur. Right. Because I wanted people to, you know, there's this pressure, right, to be a full-time entrepreneur like we just talked about. And I wanted people to kind of give them, take the pressure off and say, it's okay because here's five good reasons why this doesn't make sense for me. Um, and so the first one is the lifestyle is terrible. So you work all the time. Divorce rates and depression rates are much higher among entrepreneurs um, than in the general population. I've seen this among friends of mine who I have, you know, have friends who started these companies married and now they're either divorced or getting divorced because their partner just says after five years, you know, you've been at this for five years. We are run through our savings and you keep telling me in next month or in two months or in five months or in a year we're going to be successful here, but I can't do this anymore. I can't live in this kind of lifestyle. So that's, that's one. Number two is it's, um, you, the pay is terrible. So, uh, you know, even though you can make a lot of money in the long run, in the short run, it's very difficult to make money. Even the most successful businesses take time to generate, um, cash flow. And so people forget the average startup, successful startup takes seven years between the first round of investment and the exit. And so that's a long time. It's, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, it's not, not uh, just a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It can be years um, until you, you see that big payoff. So that's, that's number two. Three is um, you uh, may not have the right idea yet. So about 80% of successful entrepreneurs polled by Inc. Magazine found their idea while working in a previous job. You know, And so you may be totally uh, the kind of person who should be a full-time entrepreneur, but you just don't have the right idea yet. And so it's, you get, it's, it's, it's coming. Um, the fourth is, uh, it's a loss of status and affirmation. The idea that, you know, you're, if you're working in a, in a big company and you have that corner office and you get the expense account and all this sort of stuff, and then you give that up to work in a co-working space and you have to do everything for yourself. Um, and then you trade that fancy business card in for something you printed at home on your own printer. And, you know, it's, it's tough. And, and I think, family members may say like, why are you doing this? You had this amazing job that I would have killed for. And now you're trying to do something and you know, we have no idea if you're going to succeed. And finally, um, number five is, is, is that failure sucks. So the vast majority of startups fail. Failure is, is really hard on your, um, on, on your life. And in fact, you know, people like to glorify all the failures that they have before they succeed uh, because it makes our success look even greater. But if you never succeed, if you just fail forever, uh, <laughs> then, which, which happens by the way, I've had friends that have failed three times in a row and then ended up crawling back and looking for a job. And, and, and you know, it's a reality. And so we, a lot of people don't talk about that. They talk about the failures that turn into successes, but there's lots of people who just keep failing. They're just really good at failing, apparently. Oh my gosh. So let me ask you. <laughs> so what if you decide, you mentioned all of those five reasons not to become a full-time entrepreneur. What if with all of those taken into consideration, you know, somebody sees it as, you know, it's the, it's, it's, it's for the greater good, right? It's, it's, I'm doing this for something bigger than myself and outside of myself. What say you? I support that in, in, in 100%. But what I ask people to do or what I encourage people to do is before you quit your job and jump in full time, try it on the side first. 
and see what you think. Try and test ideas because people who start a business on the side um, are going to be uh, statistically about 50% more likely to succeed because you make a lot of the initial mistakes and you figure out if the business makes sense before you have the pressure of having to actually generate money or generate profits or cash flow that you need to live off. So that's kind of that for those types of people who you say to me, listen, this is what all I've ever wanted to do. I want to be a full-time entrepreneur. I say, that's fantastic, but try it part-time first so that you position yourself um, for the greatest success possible and you mitigate your risks in the greatest way possible. Now that, that makes all the sense in the world. No, for many companies, um, they kind of scoff at their employees uh, doing, knowing that they're doing something on the side. Now, how do we, with this, with this knowledge, with this background knowledge, how do we cultivate a culture of innovation, you know, for the, for the, for the 10% entrepreneur so that they feel a sense of freedom to, to do what it is that they feel that they need to be doing even whilst having a full-time job? Yeah, I love this question because it is true that some companies, probably more than half of companies, uh, are intimidated by this idea. The idea that their employees could possibly have any interests uh, outside, of, you know, when they go home for the evening or when they're at home on the weekend, that they could possibly want to do anything else is shocking to them. And and it makes me laugh because um, number there's a couple of funny, I think, things to think about. Uh, number one is 40% of millennials already have side hustles. So this is happening. Um, you, companies can dislike it or ignore it, but it's, this is the train has left the station. This is a tendency. This is a trend that is already um, very much um, taking place. Mm -hmm. Number two, some of the most innovative companies out there actually really encourage this kind of thinking. Companies like Google uh, really encourage their employees to do these types of activities. And so, and so it has been proven without a doubt, uh, if you look at a company like Google, that this kind of mindset actually is, is a very positive thing. But number three, um, and this is the part that I think is most important, is that as I mentioned, this is already happening. Companies, by ignoring this, are losing a massive opportunity to actually take all the stuff that's happening and make it benefit them. Because if you are not afraid of the fact that some of your employees may have things that they're working on, and by the way, stats show that about 70 to 80% of people who have side projects aren't looking to go do them full-time. But if you recognize that that's happening, then what you can do is actually figure out a way to bring all of the good things that your employees are, are learning on their own time and on their own money back into the workplace to make your company more successful. So, for example, um, what I tell companies to do is, number one, um, acknowledge this is happening. So no hiding. Okay, let's just all accept reality. And, and then number two, set clear ground rules because yes, uh, there are instances where this is totally inappropriate. It is not appropriate for somebody in your company to come into the office and spend the whole day working on their own project and using, you know, your postage code and your copiers and everything to work on their own business. Those things shouldn't be allowed. And so you need to set clear ground rules to let people know that's not okay. But at the same time, you can then encourage people to bring their best ideas out into the light, maybe even bring them into the company that the company could support them, invest in them, get them involved. Um, that happens at McKinsey and Company. Uh, they do that. Uh, they have a whole uh, whole process around that. And you can encourage people to also share what they've learned and have a very open culture so that everybody can learn from what's going on and you can infuse your culture with a greater spirit of entrepreneurship that will turn into companies that are more innovative, that will turn to companies that are much more resilient. Amazing. And do you have any final thoughts, Patrick? Entrepreneurship is something that is, you know, as I said before, I fundamentally believe should be available to everybody, whether in the corporate context I just talked about, um, whether it's, you know, the fact that everybody, not just the CEO or not just the people with the fancy big offices, but everybody in the company can have good ideas. Um, or if it's, you know, a student, you know, in your own personal context, if somebody who's a student or somebody who, um, you know, doesn't have, a, you know, a fancy job as a lawyer or a doctor or something, all those people who maybe we don't immediately think of as entrepreneurs or as people who could become business leaders, all of them have ideas, all of them are capable of doing these things. And 10% entrepreneurship is a way for everybody to engage with entrepreneurship. So I fundamentally believe, you know, when we were in Jamaica, um, one thing that really was enjoyable is, you know, I've now spoken about this book all over the world in all kinds of different places from the Caribbean to Latin America, to um, Asia, to Africa, to Europe, of course, the United States. And what I have seen um, 
is that no matter where you go, there are common themes. And uh, you can go to a place like Jamaica, which is which is a fantastic environment, but that has had a bunch of economic ups and downs in the last 10 years. And people get creative, right? People in Jamaica um, are creative and they find ways to do things because, you know, when the economy is a little crazy, they have to find a better way for themselves. And so I would encourage you, no matter where you are in the world, to... Uh, consider becoming a 10% entrepreneur and don't let where you are or, you know, what kind of economic environment you're operating in discourage you from giving it a shot. The 10% entrepreneur turning the advice of many business advisors on its head. (laughs) 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 Thank you so much, Patrick. Before we go, I'm going to ask you to just share with us your contact details. And you you also said in your, you know, our pre-interview chat that you do have a freebie for our peak performance community. So go ahead and share that and share how we may get in contact with you. Yes. So you can find me online at patrickmcginnis.com. And if you go to that website and you go to patrickmcginnis.com slash build your 10, you can actually download a free workbook that has a bunch of the exercises that are included in the book um, there so that you can get started today. At my website, you also find tons of resources. So I have a lot of things on the blog that, uh, that people download, like you know sample contracts if you want to do certain things and, um, and lots of stories and also lots of resources and links to all of my social media. So if you go to, I have a Facebook group if you want to join it. Uh, it's groups, The 10 Entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And 10 is the numeral 10 for, yes. for both the Facebook group as well as the uh, freebie, Build Your 10. Yes, exactly. One zero. That's right. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, you can join that. And then also um, I have Twitter, uh, PJ McGinnis, uh, Instagram, Patrick J. McGinnis. So there's all kinds of, and LinkedIn, of course. So if you go to my website, everything is connected through there. And of course, the book is available at Amazon, um, at all the other places you would imagine it is. And it's um, an audio book as well and a Kindle. So if you're interested interested in it, uh, it is very much available to you, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Patrick McGinnis, author of The 10% Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for being a guest on The Entrepreneur You today. It's been an interesting discussion, and I look forward to this episode going live. Yes, me too. Thank you so much. And um, for all Jamaicans who are listening, um, I'll work on my accent for next time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we hold you to that, right? (laughs) (laughs) What do you know? We have come to the end of another great episode of the Entrepreneur You podcast. I trust that you learned something and that something resonated with you so that you can share with others. And speaking of sharing, I'd so love for you to leave a comment on the show notes page of each episode. Well, we're talking about this one in particular. Leave a comment at the end of the page so that when you go the topic, you click down. And at the end, there is an option there for you to comment. If you're accessing through iTunes, then by all means, I'd love for you to leave a rate and review. That will keep us as a top rated podcast. It means a lot to me for you to help me out in this way, right? I know you are listening from all over the world. And I so appreciate it from Japan to Germany to India to Pakistan, everywhere in the Caribbean, in the United States, in Jamaica in particular. Big up my Jamaican peeps. Big up those, of course, in Ohio and all those other states that persons are listening in from, that you are listening in from. I so truly appreciate you. Now, if you want to reach out to me personally, you can actually send me an email, you know, send it to Henneke Watkins Porter at gmail.com. I am truly looking forward to connecting with you. If you want to send me a voicemail too, you can do that through my website. Just go to the middle at the right of the screen. There is an option for voicemail when you go to hennikawatkinsporter.com. I do want to hear from you. Remember, you were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. What good? <laughs>